Sarah Ward writes young adult fiction, poetry, and journal articles in the field of child welfare. After a 25-year career as a social worker and educator, Sarah is currently the director of the Mont Child Welfare Training Partnership. She won the 2007 Editor's Choice Award for the New England Anthology of Poetry and has been a member of the League of Vermont Writers since 2008. She has two novels, Stone Sisters and Aesop Lake with Green Writers Press. She lives in Williston with her husband Scott and their two English setters, Zoe and River. So Sarah, come on up. You're going to tell the next story. So my story is a little less funny. <laughs> I'm a social worker, so in the field of child protection. And um, so the stories that you know, I come across and engage with in the health world uh, tend to be a lot more challenging, I'll say. Um, and not always happy endings. But I have a question for you before I start my story. How many here um, have ever tried to do something new in your practice? Like just tried something, tried to interact a new way or try a new practice or take on something for the first time. You were the first one to do it in your office, right? Or the first one to do it in your team. Quite a few of you. So you, so you might be able to relate to this story. So in 2004, Vermont Child Protection System um, had been really doing a lot of training and learning about different ways of approaching and working with families. Typically, you know, for many, many years, and I'm sure some of this still happens, so I'm not trying to say this is, you know, best practice always happens, we know. But up until that point, a family would interact with the child protection system, a report gets made, and the person who goes out to meet with the family is doing an investigation, and they're looking to see what, what's wrong, what did it happen, and should the child be removed from that home? Those are the key questions, right, they're trying to answer. Do they need to put something in front of a judge? So in 2004, we started learning about different ways of interacting with families, and Part of that was to um, bring the whole family together, which is very different, right, than um, just going out and talking with a parent about what happened and what the report was. But to bring that whole family together in what we call a family safety planning meeting. So I was the first one in the state of Vermont to facilitate a family safety planning meeting. We held it in Morrisville and uh, they had a mom they'd been working with for four or five years. She had three children, ages six, eight, and 10. And we're gonna call her Debbie. And Debbie had long, straight hair. She was, um, didn't look very healthy when I met her for the first time. She had pallid skin. Her eyes were sort of dull. She was about 30 years old. She looked about 45 or 50. She had been drinking alcohol for so long and was to the point where she was blacking out so often and so frequently that her kids couldn't be safe with her. So they had gone to grandma's. They'd gone into foster care. Things would get better. She, they'd come home. Debbie rotated in and out of different relationships, most of them violent. When the violence got high, she started drinking more. When that relationship ended, she would get better. Things would get a little better for her. So she was, she was sort of at a point where the system was saying, you know, we can't keep letting these kids come back in and out of the home. Like, it's just not good for them, right? It, things are not going well. And so the, we said, let's try something new. Let's try to bring the whole family together and let's um, offer them an opportunity to really build a safety plan around her. So we started making calls. We got, um, and we got Debbie to agree that yes, she would allow her family to come together for this meeting, which is a, a big ask of someone, right? Most people who are working with child protection 
do not want their extended family to even know that they're working with child protection initially, let alone um, invite them to a meeting. But we decided that it would, you know, this, this was really necessary because the, the ultimatums that were being sort of laid out for her were not positive. So Debbie came and uh, about 10 of her family members came. We had her mother, her sisters, she had two sisters, her uh, brother-in-laws came, her cousins came, uh, and even her grandfather. So we had this, like, I don't know, and there were a number of other, it was just the whole room was filled with mostly family. I think there were three or four professionals in the room and myself. So Debbie was not really psyched about this. She came in um, pretty stressed, smoking. She couldn't smoke in the state building, so she had to go outside and smoke, come back in. We got the meeting started. And this framework was really about what's working well, what are the challenges, and what do we do next? What's the safety plan that we can build knowing this? So the family has so much more information to provide than just a single parent, right? as many of you know. Right? Understanding that culture, what's going on, and, and where are Debbie's supports, and what, is she, we, what do we know about her? So we initially, we started, you know, I, I had a big whiteboard. I had everyone around in a big U shape. And, and we um, started mapping out the family and building this genogram and seeing who was connected to who and who lived where and where had the children lived and where were the children living now. And, um, and the children were actually, at this moment, living with Debbie. But new reports had come in that were saying things were not going well. So this was the impetus for the meeting. How do we get Debbie into a safe, secure place where she can recover? She had not, she'd done AA, she had never done any inpatient treatment. So the state said right off, like, we're really willing to continue to work with you if you'd be willing to go into treatment. If you would be willing to do an inpatient and really work at getting yourself on a different track than you have been. And, um, you know, the family started talking about their worries, the, it, the thing, what was going on with the children, the challenges at school, the challenges with taking care of them, the challenges of coming to the house and finding Debbie not doing so well, the relationship challenges, all of it. It all kind of get laid out. And, Debbie sank lower and lower in her chair. She put her head down. She cried. I felt like I was doing the worst job in the world. I was like, what are we doing to this woman? We have brought all these family here, and this is supposed to be a, a good experience. This is supposed to be what helps bring her to another level, and I think we're, we're screwing up. But I kept going because, you know, you're, we're trying something new here. So then her cousin, Roger, walks over and Roger puts her hands on the back of Debbie's shoulders and he says, Debbie, we're not just worried about the kids. We're worried about you too. We wanna help you, regardless of where the kids are living. We wanna make sure you're okay. So we start talking about what works for Debbie, what's good, what you know, what are the strengths? You know, the kids are, are back with her. What got them back with her? We start building this whole frame of all the good things that are going on in her life, the good things that she's done in the past, the fact that she has been able to hold a job and pay her rent, and she owns a car that she makes the payments on. Those are all really great successes. So there are some areas of her life that are not good, but that doesn't mean it's all bad, right? We can give her some support around and build on those things that are working. And then we get to the safety plan. And it comes down to that bottom line of going into treatment. And I know we all are sitting here thinking, and Debbie was willing to go. She said no. 
She got up and she walked out. She had a cigarette. While she was out of the room, the family turned to DCF and they say, can't you make her go? Can't you require this? Can't you take her to court and, and force her into treatment? Like, what is the point of having a court if you can't make this happen? And the director says, no, it's not the way it works. It's not the way treatment works. People have to be willing, right? They have to sign the papers. We can't sign it for them. She's an adult. She has a right to make the decisions. And we need to talk about now where are these kids going to live permanently? Because the judge is not going to let them continue to bounce back and forth. Like, who in the family wants to step up and care for these three kids and raise them to adulthood if Debbie can't do it? Everyone left feeling like a complete failure. We were exhausted. I was exhausted. After the family left, we sat around all the professionals feeling like, oh my God, why did we do this? W what was the point? And would we ever do it again? I went home, you know, probably cried to my husband. I'm not exactly sure. I don't remember. It was 15 years ago. And within less than 24 hours, I got a call from the director. Debbie showed up at her door with her two suitcases packed and said, take me to treatment. She'd spent the night with her kids, with her mom, talking about what she wanted for their future. And what she wanted for their future was for her to be in it. And since that day, the state has done over a thousand family safety planning meetings. They happen almost every day of the week in some district or another across the state. So if you ever get invited to go to one, I encourage you to and try something new.